The Honorable Justices of the Supreme Court. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. All persons having business before this court are admonished to draw an eye and give their attention to the court now sitting. Thank you. Please be seated. Good morning. Welcome to the Supreme Court of Kansas. I look forward to an invigorating discussion with counsel this morning on the issues contained in the briefs. With that, I will ask the clerk of the appellate courts, Ms. Carol Green, to do the honor of calling this morning's docket. Court number 104,236, University of Kansas Hospital Authority v. Board of County Commissioners. Board of Commissioners of the County of Owensee County. I'll petition for review of Owensee County for each of both sides. Your Honor, appellant appears by Jennifer Martin-Smith and E. Lou Bjorgard-Probasco. Justices, the Board of Commissioners of Owensee County appear through counsel Norbert Merrick, County Attorney. Appeal number 106,214, State of Kansas v. Vesta, Stevens County, for each of both sides. Christina Crowes of the Appellate Defender Office for Mr. Mastis, present and ready for argument. Paul Kinski, Stevens County Attorney on behalf of the State of Kansas. Appeal number 105,182, State of Kansas v. Simpson. I'll petition for review of Jennifer Martin-Smith. Your Honors, may it please the Court, Deputy County Attorney Michael Serra on behalf of the State. Sorry, may it please the Court, I'm sorry. John Kurth on behalf of the appellee, James Simpson. And that concludes the morning docket, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Green. Before we proceed with calling the first case, I notice we have what appears to be at least one group of visitors. We have their adult supervisor stand. Announce who you are. Chief Justice Lou Mulligan and Professor Chelsea Hayden from the University of Kansas. Very good, thank you. Any other groups? Very well, we'll turn to the first case on this morning's docket. I call case number 104236, University of Kansas Hospital Authority v. the Board of Commissioners of the County of Waubonsee, Kansas. Good morning, again, Norbert Merrick, County Attorney of Waubonsee County. Justice Ness, if I could break my argument by having ten minutes on the main and reserving five minutes for rebuttal. Five minutes is granted. Thank you, sir. This case concerns a situation in Waubonsee County where a gentleman who was at the courthouse jumped from the fourth floor window and incurred injuries. We're primarily here for three particular reasons. One, concerning custody, its definition. Two, when does it end? And three, should potentially the statute 19-19-10 control the situation? The primary factor here obviously concerns custody. In this case, the Court of Appeals focused on three issues that it deemed created a custodial situation. It spoke of a secured building at the Waubonsee County Courthouse on the fourth floor. It's in the evening, the building is locked coming in. It's not locked going out. In other words, it's set up to prevent people from coming in there after hours when the business is closed. The other factor listed by the court was essentially the officer's instruction to this gentleman, have a seat, need to go look at some things, check some paperwork. At the same time, another officer was looking for the personal effects of the gentleman. That's why he had come. He wanted to get the return of his personal effects. The third factor occurred... Excuse me, Mr. Merrick. He wasn't just sitting in a waiting room, though, was he? It was sort of a secured area? Justice, I think that depends on your opinion. Okay. That area, you do come into the deputy's area past a secured door. To get in there, you have to know the security code. To leave there, you press the red button and walk out. Oh, okay. The room that he was sitting in at the time he jumped out the window 
Where the room he could have left on his own without anyone else helping him. Correct, but that's a different door. You come into what we call a day area where the officers might do their reports, where the intoxicalizer 8000 is. Mm -hmm. There's a little room off that mm -hmm. called the fingerprint room, the right. interrogation room, the visitor room, whatever you want to call it. Okay. That's where he was set. That's the place that people sit when they're waiting uh, inside that door. In that room? In that room, the door was shut also. Mm -hmm. When he was asked to take a seat, the door was shut. Mm -hmm. Whether it's secured, again, your opinion, that door is a hollow core door with a could, bathroom Could he style. walk out of it? On yes, he could. He it was have not walked locked. Out on his own. Well, yes. Wasn't there a video? There is a video, and he and walks shows up to the door. And it opens... It opens the opposite direction. Correct. It appears that or, he turned it yeah. one way, which would be a traditional way you would turn it, but the door is reversed so that the little right. button lock mm -hmm. is on the outside as opposed to the inside that you would typically find on a little bathroom door. So he does walk up in and the isn't video. the purpose of that, let me, I just want to find out, isn't that purpose of that so that people can't easily walk out of there? Well. I mean, what's the purpose of having the door... The, the the lock on the outside essentially or the middle yeah if you were to button. use it for instance if you were having visitation that room has a little portal and a, a prisoner would be put in there the door locked and the person visiting their mother brother whatever would be on the other side uh, sitting in a chair it's a temporary situation because again the room is used for multiple purposes but that would be the reason that the little button lock if you will is there. Keep in mind the room doesn't have any bars on it. There's a window, but it doesn't have bars like the rest of the facility. Mm -hmm. And he, the video shows he tried twice to open the door unsuccessfully the way you would normally open a door. I, I think justice that you, and, yes, and you then could see before it. he jumped out of the window. Correct. Yes. And I think that covered, then the question is, the officer, have a seat. Well, what meaning do you subscribe to that? Clearly... Well, the, the meaning I would subscribe, and I know custody is different for different purposes. Um, one of the factors we look at for whether someone is in custody is whether he's free to leave or she is free to leave once they're uh, told to be in a certain vicinity or a certain place. And are you telling me Mr. Contreras could have gotten up and walked out of there and had no one um, pursuing him to con further confine him, to detain him. It seems to me that the whole purpose of putting him in that, in that particular room was to confine him for a certain amount of time until they get information. Wasn't that the whole purpose of putting him in there? I mean, you didn't have him sitting in a waiting room outside, which you could have done. You put him in a room so he would be confined until you got further information. That's partially correct, but there was nowhere else to put him so that he wouldn't just wander around so the he just, So he just wouldn't walk around? or, or right, we what, want, What's the point then? We wouldn't want someone to go play with the Intoxilizer 8000, which is just right outside the door there. There was, what's no, the point there was, there was no seat there? You mean when someone comes in uh, to that facility, there's just no, no other place to put someone while they're waiting for someone to maybe get released or whatever happens? The only other place is outside the door that leads into the day room. That's where people sit during the day when they either have an appointment with the And so what was the problem with putting him there if, he's not, if you don't want to confine him? Because the courthouse is closed, and if he decided to wander downstairs, he could by bringing him in there. Also, because the deputy, she's the jailer. She's in charge of the jailer, jail that night so she doesn't have time to be going out there she brings him in there so she can go into another room to look for his personal but didn't the sheriff's officer lamb i think that's his name say i want to get more information on this person i want him in here so i can get that information i mean it's yes he did he wanted to get more information because he was wondering what was going on here that isn't much different than uh, i guess a terry stop and in a, Terry stop, or in a Terry stop, you're just not free to leave during that investigatory short phase. Isn't that right? That's correct. All right. Okay. Go ahead. 
Council, before you continue, I did want to ask, uh, what is the standard that we use to determine whether he was or was not in custody? Well, that is a very difficult question. There are a couple answers for that when you look at various opinions of the court. You could start with 22.02.9, the statutory definition of custody. True, the courts haven't always used it. Two other lines of cases then have provided guidance. There's State v. Lewis, which is mentioned in one of the earlier cases of this area of law, the Butler County case. There you have a person who uh, is involved in a wreck, kills six people in a DUI. He's escorted to the hospital by the police. There are two or three of them present there at all times, and when the hospital is done with them, they arrest him. And he needed to be in custody because if you wanted to admit the blood tests, the court had to find he was in custody, and indeed they did. There's one other line of cases, though, that sort of goes somewhat the other way. That's the Miranda cases. Take State v. Canaan. Uh, in that case, in Miranda, keep in mind it's important that they not be in custody if you want to admit the statements. In that case, the gentleman was escorted to the hospital by the police after a police chase. Officer Atwood was assigned to stay with him until released, but he was not restrained at the hospital. He was left alone for significant periods and arrested months later. In that case, they said he wasn't in custody. Most recent illustration of that is State v. Warrior, which Justice Lukert wrote, and there's an eight-factor test uh, that she refers to in discussing custodial situations. So those seem to be some other bodies of law that we can look at to get some idea of custody if we go beyond the statutory definition. Mr. Merrick, what do you think is the source of the county's obligation to pay f these expenses? Well, this is really a case law developed situation. We start with a basic concept of providing by statute humane care for prisoners. We expand that to the idea that if you're confined, well gosh, you can't go see a doctor, there's some bars in front of you. That makes sense. Now, how do we step uh, further and further away from that? Where's the cutoff of that level of care? So. I think what we have in Kansas right now is this developed line of case law, and the question that the county here is concerned with is, is there an end to it? Is there some situation where you're not in custody? Because in all the cases that established this area that we've worked our way through from 1977 to 1988, the counties always ended up paying. Can that case law continue in light of legislation? Well, I think that's what this court may have to decide. I reference 1919-10. That statute went through some changes in 2002. Primarily, we think, because of the Haskell case concerning reimbursement from the prisoners. But if you read that statute, one might wonder, is the legislature putting down the screws? Because they specifically reference 2202 as their definition. They specifically use the word prisoners and in the county. That's why I'm questioning why are we even talking about custody rather than prisoners? Well, because we have that case law out there and 1919-10 hasn't been interpreted in any way. I cited it even at the lower court, but uh, Judge Elder did not address that and neither did the Court of Appeals. Lastly, I have to tell you that there has been another statutory change. Two new statutes became effective July 1st, 2006. They also deal with this, and as you may know, uh, the Court of Appeals on September 13th entered a decision interpreting that statute, which would appear to turn overturn Wesley, uh, a 1985 decision of this case. So those statutes, which would not pertain to this case because of the date, do you agree they don't have retroactive application? Uh, I do, and the trial judge uh, said that also. Uh, so we're just looking at 1919-10. Right, because it's the only one you could look to for some statutory guidance that had changed between 
Butler County, 1988, the last case that really touched upon this, and then this enactment in 2002 amending 1919-10. Now, 1919-10 has been around for a very long time, but in 2002 it was substantially amended to deal presumably, one, with reimbursement. In other words, if the county pays for medical expenses, it can later file a civil suit against that prisoner to collect what it paid. So that right was created. But again, if you look at the language of it, it uses specific words and uses the statute in reference to what it's doing. And your position on 1919-10 is that it simply doesn't apply. He wasn't a prisoner, and he hadn't been committed to the county jail, which seems to be the... Yes, and a third factor, Section B specifically references 22-2202. Is that the legislature saying we're going to use that to just tell you what a law enforcement officer is? Or is that also what we're going to use to define custody? Because that statute appears in a clause in the first sentence of B-1. So because no court has interpreted that, I will have to rely on the wisdom of this court to see what you think of that particular situation. As I mentioned, we know that the main reason the legislature did it was because of the reimbursement situation. But the language they used doesn't clearly come into that. Now, the other part of that, the other reason they made that change is because of... Well, there may have been other cases, but I'll say the McKay case. When I was assistant county counselor in Riley County, we had a gentleman, Mr. McKay, stopped by a Kansas Highway Patrol trooper on the Gary-Riley County line, just inside Riley County. He was arrested, got out of the police car, approached the officer, and the trooper shot him. He was taken to Riley County Hospital, a hospital in Riley County, Mercy. The county got a big bill. He was being arrested on a California warrant, and he was injured by this trooper. So that statute then said, well, if you have an injury caused by a state law enforcement officer, the state will pay. So that was the other thing that 1919-10's amendment accomplished. It appears I've used up my 10 minutes in answering your questions. Unless you have more, I will return to you with my final five at that time. Any more questions of counsel? Thank you, counsel. May it please the court? My name is Jennifer Martin-Smith, and I represent the University of Kansas Hospital Authority, the appellants in this case. The central issue before the court this morning, from our perspective, is whether or not Alfredo Contreras Gonzalez was in custody, thereby rendering Waubonsee County responsible for his medical treatment. As we've discussed, it's long been the law of Kansas that a sheriff has a duty to care for his prisoners, and that has been expanded to fit what we look at as more real-world situations. It's not always so cut and dried that somebody is placed under arrest, put in the county jail, and then they receive an injury. Do you agree that we have to start with the statute and we stop with the statute, or can we still look at these 1977 and 1980? I think the latest case was 1988. Can we still look at those in light of the 2002 amendments? I don't think that the 2002 amendment had a significant impact on those prior cases. The point of the 2002 amendment was in response to Haskell v. Sullivan, which said that the counties couldn't seek reimbursement from the prisoners because there was no statutory authority to do so. And so they added the phrase, all costs incurred by the county for medical care and treatment of prisoners shall be paid from the general funds. How do we divorce the use of the word prisoner under the facts of this case, which all of the other cases there seem to be either the person was actually a prisoner at the time of an escape, the person was being arrested in the process of being arrested for a felony, was under a protective custody under the alcoholism and treatment programs, I mean, those sorts of things. In this case, there's no basis to have held this man 
um, in custody at the time he came into the jail. So how do we divorce it from the, the term prisoner? Because there are different indicia of custody at that point. No, prisoner. I'm right, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> from prisoner. At that point, had um, Captain Lamb actually had the time to go out and finish looking at the ICE detainer before Mr. Contreras jumped, he testified he would have handcuffed the guy and put him back in the jail so that... Um, Immigration and Customs Enforcement could come and pick him up. He was in a protective custodial situation, like the um, the prisoner, or I'm sorry, like the the protective custody um, alcoholism fellow. And even though that statute says prisoner, it said prisoner in 1977 when we had the Mount Carmel case, and it also still said prisoner in 1981 when we had Dodge City, and again in in the. Uh, Gray County case. So oh, if, we would, if we would follow that line, then we have to analyze whether the ICE detainer gave was like a warrant that he could have just arrested, pulled somebody into custody solely based on an ICE detainer? No, I think we have to look at what the intentions were, and as the court stated in State v. Lewis, whether he was free to leave. And I think when you look at the circumstances surrounding that, Mr. Contreras was not free to leave. He was on a locked floor in a room that he couldn't get out of and was told to wait there while we checked it out. The county can't put him in that sort of protective, isolated state, and then suddenly when he jumps out, say, oh, well, he was free to go the whole time. There, I think there's a difference between the constitutional obligation to provide care and perhaps and what I want to know is what do you think the source is then of the county's obligation to pay the third-party medical provider? Is it just a fairness sort of thing? Is it statutory? Um, I believe it's it a combination. Tied to the con I mean, where does that sure. what is the source of that? It's a combination of the, the statutory law that says that the sheriff has a duty to care for people in their, that are prisoners in their custody. And then this court's interpretation of what custody means based on those statutes and the fact that KSA 22-20 2029 doesn't always control in these instances when it doesn't make sense, when you don't have the specific person saying you're under arrest at the time he's laying and bleeding on the ground. Another important factor, I think, is um, when he went to the, uh, the jail that evening, the only person on duty was Jailer O'Connor, a woman, and she specifically testified in her deposition that she put him in the fingerprint room because she was alone in the jail that night and she was a woman and she felt that that was a more secure area. As the court questioned earlier, he couldn't just uh, wander out, he couldn't leave the fourth floor, that was the jail floor. Yes, he entered the um, the courthouse of his own accord, but once he took that elevator up to the fourth floor and the jailer met him at the elevator door, she had to key in a special code to get in, and he then was locked into the jail and then put again in this secure room. And the video clearly shows he tried to leave. He tried to open the door, he knocked on the door, and then when nothing happened, he resorted to jumping out the door. Window. I'm sorry, yes, window. <laughs> It's also, I think, imperative to know that um, when he first arrived that night, the, the jailer looked down, realized who it was, and said to herself, and, and then testified, well, this guy shouldn't be here. When they knew he was a, a drug-running felon, he'd been caught with a, a load of cash, 50 pounds of pot, and they had sent him on with significant instructions to both Shawnee County that... He had this detainer that this guy was a criminal. He wasn't some visitor who happened upon the uh, Wabunsee County Courthouse one evening. He was somebody that was known to them as a felon. They had specifically faxed and sent copies to uh, Shawnee County and to the district attorney to say, look, this guy is trouble. So when he showed up at Wabunsee County, uh, Jailer O'Connor testified she thought maybe he'd actually escaped from prison. And so the first thing she did was call her supervisor and say, hey, this guy showed up at our door. What do I do with him? And her captain, Captain Lamb, told her, hold him there and wait till I get there. And then the next thing he did was call for backup. You don't call for backup for somebody who's just a visitor at the county jail. Which brings me to the fact that, I mean, he should never have been out in the first place. <laughs> he, he had 50 pounds of pot that was valued at $100,000. What's that got to do with the issue before us today? Right. Because 
Your Honor, they're trying to say at this point, well, Benson County, that, hey, this doesn't matter, that he was just a, a regular visitor, and it, that's the point. He was not just a regular visitor. He was a drug-running, undocumented alien who had every intent, who Wabunsi County thought should be locked up. Before we proceed, counsel, yes. I'd be interested in your answer to the question I posed to opposing counsel, and that is, what is our standard to determine, as you put it, whether this individual was in custody? You've told us about a number of factors, but can you lead us to a conclusion on a particular test? Yes, I, I think the clear test uh, was articulated by the court in State v. Lewis, which is whether or not he was free to leave. Based on his objective understanding of the facts? The, the case law doesn't specifically state, I believe, whether it was his objective um, test, but I think a reasonable person would have assumed that they were not free to leave. Um, when they handcuffed his friends and his, his sister, those people uh, stated that they believed they were under arrest. People, when they're handcuffed, don't generally think they're free to leave. If it is an objective test on what is known to him, then what relevance does it have that the jailer perhaps felt insecure, so she called for her boss and her boss then called for backup. Well, it goes to their intention of placing him in a position where he didn't think he was free to leave. They put him somewhere that they considered secure. But how would the uh, individual in this case know what their thoughts were or what their actions were? Well, he couldn't completely know that, but when he's escorted into the jail behind the locked door and then put in the room that he can't get out of, I mean, he wasn't stupid. <laughs> Captain Lamb comes in and says, hey, what about that ICE detainer? And he's like, I, I, I don't know. And he realizes, I mean, he sees the writing on the wall, what's going to happen when they figure out that the ICE detainer is still on. So as I understand what you're telling us, we should look at this from his viewpoint on what was known to him, or and then whether he was justified in feeling that he was in custody? I don't think you just look at it from his perspective. I think his perspective plays an important role in whether or not he was free to leave. But I think you have to look at the surrounding circumstances of what a reasonable person would see looking at the same situation, whether he reasonably believed he was free to leave. I mean, if he was just there and, you know, there was no indicia of custody, he maybe was left in the room with the door open, that would be a different scenario. But based on his interpretation and then I think what a reasonable person would see as whether or not they had the freedom to, to walk out the door that day. So there are two prongs, a subjective and objective? Is it like self-defense or is it like Miranda, where we look at a reasonable person who would have felt free to go? Sure. I don't think that the court has actually set up that standard at, at this point. Um, the and way which, that, what's your view on it? Our, my view is that it's a two-part standard, whether the person believed they were free to leave and whether reasonably looking at the situation, that person, in fact, was free to leave. And in this instance, all those factors combined, I don't think Mr. Contreras thought he was free to leave, or perhaps he would have, and when he did try to leave, he couldn't get out the door, so he broke the window. And then looking at the circumstances surrounding him being placed in that room, the jailer testified that she felt that was more secure, she was alone there by herself, she was waiting for her supervisor who had called for backup. All those factors together show that not only did Mr. Contreras believe he was not free to leave, they were keeping him there in a secure facility as well. <coughs> and both those tests need to be met in order for him to be found in custody? Yes, I would say that would be an appropriate test. I think it's also important to note that after he jumped out the window, um, you know, Captain Lamb came racing through two different locked doors to get to the fingerprint room, where he looked out and saw Contreras laying on the ground. He then runs down the stairs with his weapon drawn, pointing it at Contreras as he lay there. Um, Contreras had tried to get up and run away, but his hips were broken and he couldn't move. He then handcuffed Contreras, who um, both he and Jailer O'Connor testified they could see his heart beating in his chest, and he couldn't move. So they handcuffed him anyway. They handcuffed his friends. They had their service weapon. He had a service weapon drawn. Again, when the courts looked at these types of situations, specifically in the um, in the Susan B. Allen, or, I'm sorry, in the Dodge City case, they said that looking at these situations, could we really believe that this person, they would have just let him run off into the sunset had he not broken his hips? And I think that 
the fact that they handcuffed him as he lay bleeding on the ground and had their service weapons drawn and handcuffed his friends, while, yes, they were concerned for their safety, that goes to show that they would not have just let him leave the situation. And, and you're taking that tact because he committed the uh, criminal damage to property before he hit the ground? And no. so he was in, he, he would have been uh, apprehended? I, I mean, I don't understand why what happened after the injury mm -hmm. is germane to our inquiry as to whether he was in custody or a prisoner or whatever uh, at the time of injury. That's true, but I think, again, it goes to, um, the criminal damage was not testified to, and it was not, um, it was not something that was a factual conclusion based at, in the district court. It was mentioned by the Court of Appeals, but I don't think that was central to the holding. I think what the court was saying was like in these other, these other cases, that we couldn't, he wouldn't have just been allowed to leave, which again goes back to, was he free to leave to begin with? I understand the argument when he's in the room. What, right. what I don't understand your argument about being handcuffed on the ground after the injury occurred. Why that has any bearing on what we have to decide. Because it goes to show that this wasn't just, again, a visitor that for some unknown reason jumped out. They were so concerned about this person and they were concerned about the security and the safety of this individual that they handcuffed him even after the injury when he was laying bleeding on the ground. Then when they laid left in Lifestar, they, they sent him off to the, the University of Kansas Hospital. Captain Lamb was on the phone faxing the ICE detainer saying, hey, we've got this bad guy coming to you. You need to be on the lookout for him. Um, the Kansas University Police Department, which is not security, it's an actual police unit, met the helicopter on the top of the building. So again, this was not just a random visitor. He was somebody that was known to be a gun-toting, <laughs> gun drug-running, undocumented alien with a pilot's license. They were concerned that he should not be out free and that he had possibly escaped. And we're not arguing that this creates any sort of long-term liability. Contreras can't come back now and say, hey, I need a hip replacement for what you did. What we're talking about is the, the acute injuries that occurred during his custodial period. Once he's released, he's done. We're not saying he gets free medical care for life. We're not um, out there to, to establish a sort of workers' compensation program for prisoners. But we're saying when you bring someone into the jail and you put them in a room that they can't get out of and then they're injured, that's custody, and at that point, the county needs to take responsibility for the person that they have in custody. And unless there are other questions, I will conclude. Do you have any further questions of counsel? Thank you. Before you sit down, oh, I'm uh -huh. kind of curious. Sure. If he's in custody in this room and then he leaves the room, is he still in custody? Was he free to leave? Well, he apparently <laughs> left. Are, are you, I'm sorry, can you, what do you... You what indicated he was in a room, right. and all the indicators, according to you, are that he was not free to leave, therefore he was in custody. He then left. Mm -hmm. Is he then out of custody, and therefore there is no obligation for the county to pay his medical bills? Once he left the hospital. Once he left the room that you say he was in custody in, has he not left the custody of law enforcement? At that point, but the injuries occurred while he was in custody. While well, he was leaving custody. Well, I mean, the analog is custody. a prisoner who escapes <laughs> and then gets shot while he's out escaped. Right. And, and the Mount Carmel court said, you know, he was still in custody. They were going to pick him up. Just because he was in the process of fleeing doesn't change the fact that he was a person in custody when he started the actions that led to his injury. Very well, thank you. Any further questions of counsel? Well, just to clarify, you're saying that an escapee is still in custody for purposes of uh, medical responsibilities? Is that what you're saying? If they're injured during the escape or immediately thereafter, then yes. Under this court's line of cases, starting with Mount Carmel, I believe that that's, that's the holding. Thank you. Thank you. Just on those first two factors, I've been in custody. Any attorney who's visited a client in a local county jail would find themselves in much the same situation. Visiting law enforcement who are visiting another facility 
would find themselves in a very similar situation. They're brought behind some secure door, maybe asked to take a seat while things are being arranged. The big so difference is of. that when I've been in interviewing and I knocked on the door, they let me out. Well, if you're being held on an ICE detainer, that they can knock on the door and they're gonna, not going to let them out. But in this situation, nobody heard him knock on the door. Jailer O'Connor wasn't even that part of the building. There was no way she could have heard it. And I would point out, even though we mentioned that, and who knows what the officer was thinking, that ICE detainer is no basis to hold him. Under law, that is not a basis to hold him. It is not a warrant. Maybe the officer didn't understand that. I don't know. But if you look at the actual uh, cases, and it's been discussed in the lower court briefs, it's not a basis uh, to detain but in this situation. Isn't the inquiry whether Mr. Contreras would know that? If Mr. Contreras says there's an ICE detainer, uh, he has to know that that's not sufficient to make him stay in that room or stay in that jail. Well, I would think he would draw that conclusion. He went to Shawnee County. He bonded out of Shawnee County. He's a free man when he comes to Abuncie County. Uh, I would point wasn't, out... Wasn't he told to go in this room, wait here until I, according to Captain Land, check out this detainer? Yeah. Wasn't he told to do that? I mean, how... Have a seat is the direct quote that Judge Elder has and in there. And wait until I... I check it out. Uh, my doctor does that to me. Uh, I want to not miss one particular point that we haven't addressed here that's extremely important based on the finding of the Court of Appeals that he was in custody. So when does it end? In this situation, unlike all the other cases, you talk about the Gray County case with the burglary shootout. The guy's in there for three weeks. But the sheriff took him there to the facility, monitored him on a regular basis, and showed up there when he walked out with a filed complaint and took him off. Here, what happens? They never talk to Wabunsee County again at KU Med. Who do they call on the day he's going to be released? First, they call ICE, because that's who's listed on their Form 571. Then they call Shawnee County. Couldn't get a hold of anybody there that day and he leaves. So why is it that he's in Wabunsee County's custody that whole time, unlike the other cases? This is critical because we're talking about money here. I mean, that's what this comes down to. So if he's there uh, for two days on our bill, okay, I guess we'll have to look at that. But does that mean we pay the full freight? How do you decide when someone's out of custody? We know that he became ambulatory on uh, no later than the 16th of April. He'll leave on the 27th. He's not restrained there. He's not guarded there. He can walk out of KU Med under his own power on that date. They don't call us about that. Why is he in Wabunsee County's custody from the 5th until the 27th when he walks out of that facility there? Why isn't he in the custody of uh, the University of Kansas uh, police department. They're a full to police department. What about Wyandotte County? He's sitting there in Wyandotte County, Kansas, presumably because of this ICE detainer. There's no warrant for him from Wabunsee County. There's no instructions that he's on a police hold. He's never charged with a crime uh, out of Wabunsee County. So when you look at that, what's the answer uh, to that particular question, I think there should be an answer. If this court chooses to uh, affirm the Court of Appeals, which is your right, then what's the answer to the question of when did he leave custody compared to the other uh, cases, particularly given who was interested in him and the forms that KU had only listing ICE? Uh, lastly, before I leave, with just my last moment here, as I mentioned, the Court of Appeals decided a case on the 13th of September. Petition for review has been filed. It involves University of Kansas Hospital Authority, Wyandotte County, and Highway Patrol. And it goes to that newer statute. But Wesley's important here because of what happened before. Wesley deals with felony misdemeanor. Who's responsible? It didn't quite address that. My time is at an end. 
Thank you very much. Before you sit down, Council, I had asked you a question during your initial presentation about what standard you believe we should apply. And according to my notes, you told us, well, it could be Lewis, it could be Miranda, it could be statutory, it could be Warrior. So before you sit down, could you tell me what you believe the standard should be applied to determine whether this individual was in custody? Well, if I was the kingmaker, I would say look at the statute, 22029, because it defines custody there, but it also defines detention. Are we going to obliterate detention in the expansion of the use of custody? Because detention has a little bit of meaning. I take it when I read detention by the statute that they're talking about a Terry stop. Custody is something different. So it would seem the clearest, the easiest, to use that word custody. But I, I know I didn't give you a direct answer because the courts have not chosen necessarily to use that. They didn't in the Butler County uh, case uh, by clear acknowledgement, uh, they didn't. Although the facts there are substantially different. The officers brought him to the Susan B. Anthony Hospital. They took, uh, they brought him there, but they brought him to the jail. From the hotel to the jail, the officers took him. From the jail, to the hospital, the officers took him. They said he was in protective custody on the sheet when they brought him in. And lastly, you had the alcohol treatment code as a form of custody. That's substantially different factually than what we have here. All right, thank you. Do we have any further questions of counsel? Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Thank you both for your arguments this morning. Court will take this matter under advisement. Now I'll turn to the second case on this morning's docket. It is case number 106214, State of Kansas v. Michael Mastis. Christina Curls of the Appellate Defender Office for Mr. Mastis. I would re request three minutes for rebuttal. Three minutes is granted. I'd like to focus my argument on the first issue of the brief and then submit the others on the brief unless this court has questions. And the first issue deals with prosecutorial misconduct. Um, just briefly, in, when we review an issue of prosecutorial misconduct, there's a two-pronged test. The first is to determine whether or not the prosecutor's comments fell outside the wide latitude given to prosecutors when discussing the evidence. And the second is determining whether or not the defendant's right to a fair trial was prejudiced by, those, by that misconduct. In this case, um, I would, all four instances of misconduct that we allege in our brief deal with either misstating or mischaracterizing the evidence or discussing facts and making inference not based upon the evidence. Specifically, um, we assert that the state, in its closing argument, misstated or mischaracterized the testimony of three of seven witnesses who actually testified in this case. Um, the first of which would be the sister of Mr. Mastis, who testified for the defendant. In its closing argument, the state argued, or the state told the jury that Jennifer Mastis testified that Lorenza Mastis, the mother and the victim in this case, loved her children. She said that about her mother, but she didn't say that Mr. Mastis returned the favor. Obviously, he didn't have the same feeling. Now, the actual testimony from Jennifer Mastis was that her mother loved all of her children, and when asked specifically about Mr. Mastis' feelings for the mother, she testified he felt the same way. He had that same love. Now, the state in its brief tried to argue that its comment was merely a reaction. It was merely addressing testimony brought out by the defense. But, but that's not what they said in their closing argument. In the closing argument, the prosecutor said that Jennifer Mastis didn't say that Mr. Mastis returned the favor. He mischaracterized the testimony that, didn't, that actually came out. He didn't draw an inference from the testimony, from the evidence. He mischaracterized that evidence. She said exactly the opposite of what she said. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, I mean... That seems to be the most egregious of the misstatements that we have. The other two misstatements that we have are not direct contradictions from the evidence, but they're still misstating 
I'm mischaracterizing what the testimony actually was. The second was from Officer Gene Johnson, who I believe was the first responding officer at the scene who first spoke to Mr. Mastis. The state told the jury during closing argument that Officer Gene Johnson testified that Mr. Mastis appeared to be a person who had just done something wrong. That was Gene Johnson's testimony. Now, we argued that that was a misstatement or a mischaracterization of that testimony because that wasn't what he testified to. What he testified to is that when he first saw Mr. Mastis after the incident, he didn't find Mr. Mastis to be totally emotional. You know, he wasn't in tears. I felt like he kind of resigned himself to the fact that this had happened. Now, the state once again tried to say that what they said during closing argument was a reasonable inference from what was actually testified to. Our argument is, if what they had done is said, this was Officer Johnson's testimony. From that testimony, we can draw the conclusion, not necessarily in these words, but we can draw the conclusion that Mr. Mastis acknowledged that he had done something wrong. Didn't the officer also testify that um, the defendant handed him a knife and said, this is what I did it with? Yes. Isn't that a, isn't that a, reasonable argument based on that testimony? I guess the difference, the, the distinction that I'm trying to draw here is in its, in, I'm, I, I'm getting into the answer to your question, but in its brief, the state mentioned all of these factual, this factual testimony of the officer that he handed him the knife, that he showed him the room, and then said that it's a reasonable inference that he had done something wrong. And I would argue that that's true, that that could have been a reasonable inference. And if that was the argument that was actually made to the jury, it would be a different story. But what the argument that was made to the jury was is that Officer Johnson testified, Mr. Mastis appeared to be a person who had just done something wrong. That was Gene Johnson's testimony. He was giving it to a jury as almost a quote of the testimony as opposed to an inference to be drawn from that testimony. And that's where we think that the misconduct occurs. It's mis, almost misquoting, misstating what the actual testimony was. He was. You're saying that the fact that he said that was his testimony means he was quoting rather than summarizing or inferring from? I, I would say that that's what a jury would take from it, okay. is that if, if I heard a prosecutor say that was the testimony, I would take that to mean that that was the testimony, not that was a conclusion that you can draw from that testimony. And I think word choice definitely plays a big part of prosecutorial misconduct in closing arguments. I think people say that all the time when they're summarizing. That was John Smith's testimony. That was Mary Jones's testimony. And I think the difference in this case is that the the way that the prosecutor phrased it, because the the prosecutor did phrase Officer Gene Johnson testified X, Y, Z, that was his testimony. And then, this goes more to the um, harmless error analysis, but then the jury had wanted the testimony of all officers, all law enforcement to be read back to them, and it wasn't. They were told to rely upon their collective memory, so there still may may have been some potential confusion about that testimony. Isn't the the distinction more about... uh, uh what we're talking about, whether the circumstances suggest defendant did something wrong versus his appearance was that of a guilty person that had done something wrong. I mean, isn't that the difference that you're trying to to draw here? Right. I mean, essentially what the state told the jury is that this officer testified to an opinion that he didn't actually testify to. Now, the third instance um, was the pathologist testimony. The pathologist, the state, told the jury that Dr. Peterson also made the state, a statement that was unrefuted in the sense that in his examinations, wounds that are inflicted to the face are of a personal nature. Now, he didn't say the doctor did not testify that wounds inflicted to the face are of a personal nature. His testimony was that wounds inflicted to the face are more often not inflicted by someone who knows the victim. Now, our argument as to why that this was misconduct is once again, the state said that this was an unrefuted statement by the doctor when he didn't actually use those words. But second, and the state acknowledged in their closing argument that they didn't have evidence of motive. But now they're using the words of a personal nature to 
almost imply or put some sort of a reason for Mr. Mastis's actions on him at this point. But in the end, the jury heard the defendant's own statements and admissions that he stopped at the bedroom door, he saw her sleeping, he entered the room, and he repeatedly stabbed her 150 times. I mean, so, you know, let's accept the notion, hypothetically at least, that the prosecutor's statements were stepped over a line or were improper. There's still pretty good evidence here uh, upon which to convict. And I think that goes to what was at issue in this case. In this, ish, in this case, it was never at issue of whether or not Mr. Mastis stab, stabbed his mother. What was at issue was the intent, whether or not he intended to kill his mother. And, and when the state in their closing argument acknowledges there is no motive, we have no motive, and in every instance of misconduct that they that they commit in some way as trying to, I guess, input, and that's probably the wrong word, but give the jury a reason to believe why Mr. Mastis would do something like this from the point of them saying that he doesn't love his mother to he acknowledged that he did something wrong or he appeared to be someone who had done something wrong, that the wounds were of a personal nature, and then the worst of all was in the rebuttal where the prosecutor said, and as, and I wonder, as Mr. Masta stood above his mother, stabbing her on the bed and on the floor after she screamed for him to stop, was this a nightmare that's coming true? This is a worse nightmare of hers, or was this something Mr. Mastis had been dreaming of? There was no evidence in this case that Lorenza Mastis was afraid of her son. In fact, in its, in its brief, the Don't state... Don't you think she was at that point? I mean, that's the problem I have with this argument. It may not have been a nightmare she had before this started, but wasn't she living a nightmare as she was stabbed 150 times? Well, as she was, as she, I, and I would say that that's probably true, but the wording of, that the state used implied that this was something that she had been dreading. I have nightmares, and I, I'm afraid that they're going to come true. How, but I, can, explain that to me, how you get that from that wording. Was this a nightmare that's come? this a worse nightmare? I mean, I guess to me, a nightmare implies something that you've thought about before. A nightmare that you're afraid of coming true is the situation where you have a nightmare about someone attacking you, and now that's coming true for you. I believe uh, what the state said in its rebuttal implied to the jury that there was there was some reason prior to this for Lorenza Mastis to be afraid that her son was going to stab her in the middle of the night, that her son was going to attack her, when that inference was in no way supported by anything in the evidence. Even when the state was defending it in its brief, it didn't try to tie it to any evidence. It simply said that it was a reaction, it was a response to the defense argument that... I, I don't understand how whether uh, or not his mother was afraid of him has anything to do with intent which is what you have to argue to get to prejudice, because otherwise you just say 150 wounds, screaming for him to stop. Well, I, th I think what it goes, I think what it goes, um, comes down to, which is what I argued in my brief, is that the state, in, committing, in each one of these instances of misconduct, they were trying to bolster the weakest point of their case, which was motive. And I understand that they don't have to prove motive, but juries still want to know why someone would do something like this. And with each instance, and even this last instance where the jury, well, where the state by saying this implied to the jury that Lorenza Mastis was afraid of her son, that she had been afraid of him, that she had been fearing that something like this would happen, when there's nothing in the record to support that inference. And the state doesn't cite anything in its brief from the record to support that inference. They say that it's not improper because it's a reaction to a defense argument. You can respond to a defense argument, but you can't make up stuff in order to do it. Can I move you real quickly to uh, uh, what I'm reading is that the evaluation didn't pan out. There was some, some testimony that the evaluation didn't pan out, which I took to mean that um, Mr. Mastis was not able to get an evaluation to use to notice up a diminished capacity defense. 
What, the, what is that a correct just, just uh, to clarify is the defense did initially um, try to pursue a diminished capacity in that Mr. Mastis was incapable of forming the content, consent. The evaluation didn't necessarily support that, but the defense was still that he did not have that intent in this case. Well, see, that's, that's the problem I'm having is that you didn't have the evidence to use that defense so the exclusion of that def uh, uh, evidence destroyed the, the defendant's theory of defense. If you didn't meet the statutory um, requirements to utilize as, that as a defense, why do we care if the defendant still wanted to use that as a theory of defense when well, they didn't meet the statute? My argument would be is that there are two different things. One is the diminished capacity, which is that he was incapable because of his mental illness from actually forming the reckless intent. The other is that he simply didn't have the intent in this case. And the district court found, and it, it found that evidence of him hearing voices was relevant, and our argument was is that they just cut it off. Where they allowed his sisters to testify that in the two months prior he had been hearing voices as evidence that he was in fact hearing voices that night. And so you're saying he didn't have the intent here, not that he couldn't, but he didn't have the intent here because he was hearing voices. Yes, and basically... And I don't understand how I, I, I'm having trouble splitting that here, why that isn't that of arguing that he has a condition, a mental condition that that precluded uh, forming the intent if you're saying the intent didn't happen because he was hearing the voices and he was stabbing the voices. Split that and, hair and I, I understand it is a, it's, it's a difficult hair to split, but in this case, picked one what the defense attorney was arguing. The it problem is you have a theoretical distinction between incapable of forming intent and not possessing intent. There's a theoretical distinction. Correct, correct. And, what, and that's the one you're trying to rely on, but the evidence is the same. And what, exactly. And what the theory of the defense was in this case is that he went into his mother, mother's room to attack the voices, not to attack his mother. So in this case, because he was hearing those voices, he did not have the intent or the premeditation to kill his mother. He was going in there to attack the voices. And while the jury did hear evidence of that he had been hearing voices for two months previous, that, that evidence came from his sisters, and the state attacked um, that evidence on cross-examination on the grounds that these sisters, of course, loved their brother, and they didn't want anything bad to happen to him, giving the jury the, the impression that this was a defense that was simply made up for trial. Evidence that the officer, that this separate officer had known of these voices for years prior, that every time he had interacted with Mr. Mastis in the past, Mr. Mastis told him that he heard voices, bolstered that theory. And it is our argument that, that under issue three, that not allowing, once the district court acknowledged that those voices were relevant by allowing evidence to come in, by not allowing that same evidence from the detective to further bolster that theory of defense, to ha allow some evidence to come in from someone other than a relative of the defendant, deprived him of his right to present his defense, to fully present his defense. Just real quickly, if uh, the court, district court, believed Dr. Shannon that the IQ was 80 to 90 and that the defendant was feigning, then that would be sufficient evidence for a denial of the, uh, uh, th that defendant was retarded. Yes. Wouldn't you agree? I would, I would agree with so that. So you're really asking us to, to disregard Dr. Shannon's testimony? I, I, I mean, in a sense, there was evidence from both. Our argument is, is that because there was evidence that he was moderately or mildly mentally retarded, that the court should have and found And our standard that. usually is and if there's evidence of both, then I, the I, district I, court's ruling I acknowledge stands. that there was evidence of both, yes. I'm just curious about this. Is there an Alleen problem with the district court making a finding on retardation or the absence of it? Um, to govern a mandatory minimum? It, or it to honestly, govern a minimum? It minimum. Me that there could be an Alleen problem until you just mentioned it. Um, Something to I think mean, about. In this case, I mean, he was sentenced to the 25, so there was nothing more. Mm -hmm. Just off the top of my head, I can't 
think of an alien problem because it, it's a dispositional thing. And even this court has said that dispositional, that the Apprendi doesn't apply to an upward dispositional, even though I would question that now in light of Aline. But right. under Gulhar, I believe that an upward dispositional departure, since it's not an increase of sentence, but rather. But um, like I said, I honestly haven't thought about Aline in relation to this simply because he did receive the mandatory minimum of 25 years. And unless there are questions, um, I would just ask the court to reverse Mr. Mastis's conviction. Any further questions? Thank you, counsel. May it please the court, my name is Paul Kitsky. I am the Stevens County attorney representing the state of Kansas. Um, and I was the trial prosecutor in this case. And, and a few things that I want to touch base with in regards to um, the prosecutorial misconduct argument is that this court has to look at the totality of the evidence and, and it looks at all of the evidence that was presented. And in, in this case, Mr. Mayas just stabbed his mom with a pocket knife uh, approximately 150 times. There was testimony from him that she had begged him to stop this. Yes, Justice Jones. But we only look at the totality of the circumstances if we find there was error or misconduct or, or uh, a problem, right? I agree with and that. So you're jumping right to the reversibility? No, I, I want to. I'll look. I'll go for the first part and the first two. Uh, in regards to, to the wide latitude of prosecutor of prosecutors being able to make those statements, or uh, the second prong is whether the comments prejudiced the jury against the defendant to deny him a fair trial. We we believe that that we did not. And and there are four arguments that the um, defendant makes today, and we want to address those in that order. That the first and the fourth argument were in response to. Um, statements that were presented on the defense and, and the claim uh, to show that it was unreasonable uh, by the prosecutor in closing arguments that it was uh, that the love was not shared for the mother that she had allegedly had for Mr. Mastis uh, on testimony the sister said that the mom without a doubt loved her children loved them wholeheartedly and would never do anything to harm them uh, the state takes the position that uh, unless there's a skewed kind of love stabbing your mother 150 times when she's begged you to stop in the middle of the night when she's provided for you for your entire life uh, is not the same kind of love that was testified to that the mom had for the son. Um, that was in response to witness evidence by the defendant. The, the second issue uh, deals with um, Officer Johnson's statements uh, and, and to touch upon Justice Byer, your statements that... I have a question, if we can just step back on that one, the, the Jennifer... Uh, testimony, the sister's testimony. Um, I think the quibble that your uh, colleague has raised is that you you attributed that to the sister as opposed to just contesting what she said. And the sister said, we loved our mom, our, our mom loved us, and we all loved our mom back. I mean, that's in essence what she said. Not surprising testimony. Right. And, and I think that the complaint that your opposing counsel is raising is that you attributed to the sister something she didn't say. Well, not, not whether the evidence supports that maybe you didn't love her as much as you're saying, because 150 stab wounds is 150 stab wounds. You see what I'm saying? Well, I, it's the I, attribution that's the problem. In, in giving, saying direct, quoting her directly as opposed to inferring that. Yeah, that indicating to the jury that she testified that he didn't love her back, which is actually the opposite of what she said. Well, and and and, and if I misspoke on that, then I mean that I understand that that's okay. something that happens. I understand and, the prejudice argument. I'm just sure. want to focus in on what the complaint is. Okay, thank you. Well, and the issue that that we look at the second thing is that. Um, when, when Officer Johnson arrived at the scene, um, uh, he was called there in the middle of the night. The call was made by Mr. Mass to, to, to come to the scene, and, and he gives him the knife, uh, and, and he has a calm demeanor, and he has, uh, I guess, you know, he's not uh, crying or ecstatic or, uh, or acting irrational, and he, and he says, you know, I want to show you what I've done, and he, t and he takes her into the scene, and, sh and, and there's the mom on the floor with the 150 stab wounds. Um, and then he testifies, or he uh, admits, uh, confesses to Officer Johnson at the house, and then later testifies, or 
um, admits to the officer, uh, the sheriff's deputy, uh, at the law enforcement center, the same thing, that he went in, stabbed his mom, she asked him to stop, uh, and then he continued that. So the, the issue that, I guess, uh, appeared to be someone that had done something wrong, that was the inference that we made in that. In regards to the personal nature, Dr. Peterson testified to stab wounds to the face being of a nature that are personal. I, the state can think of no other relationship between a, a, a child and, and, a, and a mother that is that is more personal. So that inference we would feel is obviously within our discretion because uh, the testimony was also made that um, that, that Mr. Massis not only uh, had a relationship with his mom, but she, but he was a grown man and that he had lived with his mom and he had always lived with his mom. And so that was the inference that we made there. But the, I think was established earlier, perhaps with opposing counsel, it's not an inference that was drawn. It was attributing that direct testimony to Dr. Peterson. And, and the issue, uh, Chief Justice, in regards to that is that I guess the, the, the state didn't take the, the say directly quoted, or we didn't say in, in our arguments that we don't to take him word for word that this is what he said. I think the issue that we looked at was the, the statements and the testimony by Dr. Peterson, and then the evidence that was presented to uh, the jury. Uh, obviously, was the inference that we made that there was of a personal nature. And I don't know. If well, here here's how I show the language from the trial. Quote: Dr. Peterson also made a statement that was unrefuted in the sense that in his examinations, wounds that are inflicted to the face are of a personal nature. And I'm just saying it sounds like you're quoting Dr. Peterson for that statement and not just drawing an inference from something else that he said. So could you address that? Well, if, and if, that's, if it's perceived that I'm quoting him directly, that's not the intent to misquote or to mislead the jury. I mean, that that's not the state's... Uh, that would be not be the state's uh, intent in this matter. And I think that if, that if you take that, I guess, to go off of Justice Johnson's earlier questions or to, to correct me, uh, if you take it the next step, uh, I, I think you look at the totality of the, of the evidence and you look at all of the evidence, and I don't think that it meets the, the standard that it was of bad faith or of ill will to, to meet prosecutorial misconduct. Um, the, the other issue that I, that I will touch upon uh, is that um, in regards to the evidence that, um, or, or to complete this, in, in the regards to uh, the evidence of the mental health examination and, and the denial by the court, uh, there was a, uh, an examination requested by the defendant. The defendant asked to have uh, an, an evaluation done in order to present or try to present the diminished capacity argument. Um, and that was, and that was uh, determined by the court that the evidence was not there. And, and, and one thing that was, was important in this case is that the, the defendant tried to, uh, at, the, at the jury trial, the defendant tried to, I think, in a sense, try to backdoor or was going to uh, trying to backdoor uh, the issue of the intent and the issue of mental capacity. Well, it actually happened. There were uh, more than one witness made reference to his hearing voices, correct? That's correct. And I think that that was, you know, the, the issue that, that caused the state to file a motion in limine is that we, that we had asked for that because we anticipated that. And so the, the argument that is made by the defendant in, in his brief is that, that, the, that he was denied a, an opportunity to present a defense, but the statute clearly he did not meet the standard in that, and he was unable to provide um, the reports and then to give the state the notice for that. So was, that, that, was there ever... Um, as a part of the diminished capacity evaluation, did that encompass also a competency evaluation? At the very beginning of the at the very beginning of the case, Mr. Massis was sent to Larned for a uh, competency evaluation, and he was returned. Um, right, that's that's right. Okay, thank you. So, and the issue that that, that was important in that case, I think, is that the state took the position in regards to. Uh, the attempt to backdoor or the attempt to introduce the evidence of the diminished capacity um, in regards to how they built up or how they presented the case that, that Mr. Masters, I think, uh, lo so loved his mom and that he was that he was so dependent upon her and that the, and that's why I think that the the court was proper in denying that evidence because. Uh, 
first of all, the statutory requirement wasn't met, and second of all, you could foresee that that was something that they were trying to play uh, to the jury or that they would want to present as their defense. So that's the second issue, or that's the third issue. Um, I will touch upon uh, the issue in regards to um, the let me back up. On the third issue, the other the other thing that I think is important for the court to consider is that um, when the defense when the defense for diminished capacity was denied by uh, the defendant, that no proffer was made to the court as to what should have been presented, and there was nothing made to the court as to what could have been presented, which therefore this court does not have anything to review as to what that defense would have been. But the, the second. The second matter uh, deals with the jury instruction for reckless second-degree murder. Uh, the parties obviously have briefed that, and I think that Judge Ambrosier, the trial judge, uh, made the finding that there was no evidence as to uh, reckless second-degree murder, and I think that's only uh, bolstered uh, in his reasoning by the fact that he gave the voluntary manslaughter instruction uh, by saying that there's very, very little evidence of that, but that he would instruct that. Uh, based on the evidence in the 150 stab wounds, the fact that it was just Mr. Maestas and his mom, she was asleep, he went in to the room, you know, and, and stopped before he went into the room, peered through the, with the light of the bathroom, peered into the room, went in, stabbed her, she begged him to stop, he continued to stab. The, the court said there was no evidence as to reckless, and I don't think that the, the trial court made an error in regards to that. If the court, I guess, to go back to Justice Johnson, your position, if the court does uh, find, or, or if you think that of the four arguments that there that there is, uh, that it moves to the point where you evaluate it under the totality of the circumstances, I would just ask the court to look at the, the issues that I first talked about, and the fact that there was, there's no issue, uh, there's no smoking gun, uh, there's, no, there's no issue in this case that... Um, that there's any doubt as to who did this. There's no doubt. There's no issue in this case uh, as to Mr. Maestas because of his two confessions, because of the fact that he stabbed her 150 times, the fact that he told two independent officers on two different circumstances of what happened, uh, that I don't think it would be reasonable to think the jury w was prejudiced or that the jury could not have uh, returned a verdict other than guilty. The, the issue as to motive and the issue as to whether we have to prove a motive, the defendant accurately stated we didn't have to provide that. This was a premeditation case. There was no, there was absolutely no doubt. There is no doubt as to who did it, how it was done, and so I think the issue is to the prosecutor, prosecutor misconduct. Even if you find after the first two prongs, I don't think that you can that it meets that that standard. If there are any other questions, what was your theory of premeditation? Pre, the premeditation theory in this case was that uh, it was test. The, the the evidence was that Mr. Mastis was was laying in his bed, uh, and on the opposite side of the house, uh, he was laying in bed. He thought about it. Uh, now there was testimony as to whether or not voices were being heard, but he thought about going into his mom's room. He got up, got his knife, walked around the hall, walked down one hall, made a turn, went back down the hall, looked in through the looked in through the door and then also went in and stabbed her. The other thing is that there was no heat of passion, there was no argument, there was no evidence as to any any fight or, or any fury between the two of them, other than when the stabbing started, obviously she was trying to defend herself, but there was nothing that Mr. Massis was reacting to uh, of a fight earlier in the evening, and, and I think the testimony from the defendant that they presented is that the mom had never had arguments or had never even fought with Michael because uh, because she'd always provided for him. So that was the issue that, that he thought about it. He had time to, to turn around, and, and he, he did not. So you you really focused on thought process before the first stab. I did. And this isn't one of those cases where you were really focusing on sometime during this process of inflicting 150. Um, no, absolutely not. I think the issue was that the, the thing that, that was big for the state is not only did he, he, he was in his own bed, she was in her own bed on, on different sides of the of the house, and that he, he, he got up, got his knife, walked down the hall, went down another hall, then he looked into the room, uh, from what he said, the only witness we had is, is, is Mr. Mastis himself, and, and he states he looks into the bedroom, and then that's when he goes in to, to stab her. And then uh, that, that's where we focused it at, not, not after the first stab, but I, I guess we could have looked at that, especially when he testifies that she screamed for him to stop and he just kept stabbing. 
On the last issue, uh, the uh, refusal to send uh, Mr. Mathis to the Longer State Hospital under 223430, um, are you relying on uh, the Atkins case to say it's not reviewable? That's the case that I had, you know, or Justice Toots. Can, can you help me with that? Um, the way I read Atkins, it said that it's not reviewable because the district court has the authority to send to Larnard, but there's no duty uh, to do so. And I'm trying to distinguish that scenario from Jessica's Law 2146-43. The district court judge can um, uh, uh, depart from the hard 25, but isn't required to. But we review that under an abuse of discretion, and I'm so I'm I'm, I'm trying to understand why this. It seems to me that either the, the the definition or essence of discretion, judicial discretion, is that you have the power to do it, but you don't have to. And, and I think if you take it in this case. Uh, Justice Johnson, there was no evidence presented at all. No, I'm not talking about. Oh. We're talking about reviewability. Okay. The Atkins says we can't even review it because the district judge can do it or not do it, um, and there's no individual right to have it done. Um, and, and I'm just trying to say that if the judge would say, "Okay, today, because you're a black female, I'm not going to send you to Larnard." Or because you're wearing a tie that's offensive to me, I'm not going to send you to to Larner today. That we can't review that for being an abuse of discretion. I mean, I, I don't understand why that this particular statute is so unique that it precludes review of arbitrary, capricious uh, action. Not that that happened here, but we're talking about reviewability. I, why, why is that precluded? And, and the only argument that I would think, or the only reason I would say that, is is that if you allow everything to be reviewed as to the as to where they're sentenced or to how they're sentenced in regards to uh, whether they're sent to Larned or they're sent to DOC or whether sent, if I think if this court would allow that to be reviewed, then every appeal would start coming in seeking that. And I think that the court has made it clear that as long as it's a legal sentence, that there's no that there is no well. Right. The flip side of that is, if the district courts can do whatever they want, whenever they want, why are we here? Well, and I, I guess I don't have a, a good enough answer for you, Justice. Thank you. Any further presentation, counsel? No, sir. Do we have any further questions? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I just want to clarify a couple of things that the state mentioned during their argument. Um, on issue three, they said that there was no proffer as to the evidence that would have been admitted. However, on page two of my brief, I do indicate that during the motion, hearing on the motion in limine, um, defense counsel told the court the evidence that they wanted to present, which was the evidence of the previous officers having contact with him and, the, and Mr. Mastis telling him, telling them that he had heard voices. Additionally, on page 17 of my brief, there, there was an actual proffer made during trial. When um, the defense attorney attempted to introduce this evidence, state object, jury was sent out. The detective himself, the detective topless, told the court that his last, that in most of his previous dealings with Mr. Mastis, Mr. Mastis told the detective that he heard voices and that his last dealings were two to three years prior to this incident. So I just wanted to clarify that there was a proffer. We know what evidence that the defense was trying to admit but did not get admitted. So that, that it, he may not have said, I formally proffer this evidence, but the evidence is there, so the issue is reviewable. The other thing I wanted to briefly touch on is the, the overall argument that... Um, the state argued that, well, I may have misspoken when it comes to what um, the sister actually said, or it may have been a misstatement when it comes to attributing something to a one witness or another. 
I guess our argument is, as well, first of all, I did listen to the arguments last month in which this court questioned whether or not ill will is still viable. And I would argue that what's going through a prosecutor's head and why they make the statements doesn't make a defendant's trial any more fair if that affects the jury's verdict. So I would agree, or I don't know, I guess not necessarily agree, but I, I would make the argument that ill will shouldn't matter. But even if it does matter, we know only seven witnesses to testify and the state misstates or mis mischaracterizes three of those witnesses' testimony. I would argue that that does reach the level of ill will, um, that it was repeated. And it is an issue of being careful with the words that you use in front of the jury. And if you're not careful with the words that you use in front of the jury, and it prejudices the defendant's right to a fair trial, I believe that you should be held accountable for that. And that um, it should be something that the court does take into account. Our argument is, is that it did prejudice his right to a fair trial. Because as the state said, and as I said previously, this isn't a case where he denied doing the act. The only issue in this case was the premeditation and the intent. Now their argument was that he thought about it and he got his knife and he walked to the other end of the house and he stabbed his mom meaning to do so. The other argument is the defense case was that he heard these voices so he went in there to attack the voices. All of the statements of misconduct by the state go to attack and make the nature of the crime more personal but personal by saying that he didn't love his mother or the wounds were of a personal nature or he seemed like someone who knew that he had done something wrong or his mother had had nightmares about this and was fearing it. That's why we would say that this misstatement and the misconduct by the state did prejudice his right to a fair trial and his conviction should be reversed. Any further questions of counsel? Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Thank you both for your arguments this morning. The clerk will take this matter under advisement. This time the court is in recess for 15 minutes.